So welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin Gallagher. I'm the director of the Global Development Policy Center here and a professor of global development policy at the Party School of Global Studies. Uh, the GDP Center and the Party Center for the Study of the Longer Range Future are sponsoring today's event. This, we're proud that this is the second time that we've uh, been part of the, the launch rollout of UNCTAD's flag, flagship report, the Trade and Development Report. I think a couple of years ago you launched the 2017 version here, um, <clears throat> uh, which was about austerity in, in Europe and across the world. And this one is about financing a global Green New Deal. The United Nations has watched what's uh, going on with the conversation about a Green New Deal in the United States, and this report uh, talks about the need for this to be a global thing, not just a handful of national efforts uh, across the world. The uh, lead author and the head of the Globalization Strategies Division of UNCTAD uh, is Richard Codsell Wright, uh, who I'm, I'm, I'm privileged to also uh, have as a friend. He is a PhD from uh, Cambridge in, in economics, and his unit in um, his unit at UNCTAD has really uh, sprouted so many incredible minds who have done things within the UN system, within academia, uh, just to name a few. Danny Roderick was in that group. He's now over at a community college across the street. Oh no, am I live streaming this? Um, <laughs> Rogerio Studart, an economist who uh, uh, had an academic uh, career in Brazil, but then went on to be his country's um, uh, ambassador to the World Bank and uh, lead, lead negotiator in, in all the BRICS, the discussion of the BRICS Bank and the, and the contingent reserve arrangement. Ha Jun Chang, Yilmaz Akius, just an incredible group of people that have been putting this thing out since what, 1981? Since 1981. Um, and this one might be one of the more innovative ones that they've had, uh, in my humble opinion, although I haven't read the whole thing. I'm waiting for the presentation. Um, what else should I announce that we have going on this semester? Um, API. Uh, yeah, we have, uh, uh, we have a couple initiatives here at the Global Development Policy Center. One of them is called the Global Economic Governance Initiative, and that's really the space that we're in today. We look at the International Monetary Fund, the development banking community, and the trading system and ask the extent to which these rules are fostering financial stability, human well-being, and the environment across the world. We have another group that just looks at China's global presence called the Global China Initiative. We had a wonderful event last Friday here with uh, Jin Lechun, the president of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Uh, another one of our groups is called the Human Capital Initiative. These folks look at investments in health and education and their impacts on short and long run development. And you can look out here, we've got a regular seminar series, a research seminar series, where folks are presenting their draft research papers. Uh, on health and education in, in sub-Saharan Africa and other, other parts across the world. So sign up for that um, and you can come to our um, you can come to our Global China Research uh, Colloquium which are almost every Monday and or Wednesday each week. I think our next one is um, is uh, Yunnan Chen, right? Uh, from SAIS uh, who will be talking about Chinese investment in, in, in energy in Africa. Is that correct? Excuse me? Railways. railways. All right, Chinese railways in Africa. The week after that, we'll have Lucy Hornby, who is the uh, uh, China correspondent for the Financial Times. She's over at Harvard for the semester, and uh, she's going to be talking about China and the Belt Road Initiative. So lots of exciting events we'll be having here in this room over the course of the semester. You just go out there and sign up on, on our little uh, iPad there, and you'll be sure to get an email about that and many other things that we're up to. Um, so the way we like to do it here, we give the presenter 35 minutes or so. Please only interrupt the person if you have a clarifying question, and that will give us plenty of time for question and answers. So really excited to hear about the Trade and Development Report this year, and excited to have Richard Kozel right here again. Take it away, Richard. Thank you, Kevin. I don't like lecterns, really. Um, Nice to be back again. I think, no, it's okay. I, uh, I think this is the third one, actually. I, I think we did all, and, and the importance of what I want to say today is that there's a kind of, tr it's a kind of, like all good movies, this, there's a trilogy. This is the last, it's the last of the, of the trilogy. It's, it's probably more Mad Max than Lord of the Rings, um, although there's a bit of The Godfather definitely thrown in there. We're going to, we want to make you an offer you can't refuse, I think, in a way. 
Um, but it's very important for us that you, I mean, people who are interested in the arguments that I want to present today understand that behind it are a couple of other closely linked reports. And indeed, I'll make, I'll, I will make a little bit of a reference to, to these in, in my presentation. Hopefully, I can do this in half an hour and, and we, can, we can open it up uh, to questions. Oh, dear. Is this not working or am I doing something wrong? Probably doing something wrong. Okay. And then you can just click the arrows. All right. Thanks. Phew. That was. That was. So, so this is the last. This is the latest one. This is on the. It's on the. It's on the global green new deal. And I want to try and. and what I want to try and really do for you is not to go into the intricacies of each. Uh, each chapter in the report. I think that would be a little bit boring. What I want to try and do is to give you the broad context into which, through which we've gone to reach this uh, argument of a, of a kind of different way of thinking about the economic and environmental challenges in a multilateral context. That's what we're trying to do. Um, and we, be, I mean, we begin this, and, and it, we should say that the, the use of the New Deal as a term is, is um, it's a conscious decision that we make. Lots of people always refer to New Deals when they want to sound ambitious and serious and that they're going to do something, you know, that, that the international community can get. They talk about a New Deal, usually very um, loosely. In fact, and, and indeed, just to start off with a, a kind of story, when I, when I was in, before I was in, or, or a break in, in my time at UNCTAD, I worked at the UN uh, in New York in the Department of Economic and Social Affairs uh, in 2008, 2009, which was, of course, the time of both the global financial crisis and the Copenhagen COP, which was meant to be the COP that was going to solve the problems of, the, of what were being recognized as, as, as an increasingly dangerous uh, 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 rising in global temperatures. Um, and we came up then, first of all, with the idea of a global Green New Deal that would somehow deal with the financial crisis and deal with the impending uh, climate crisis. Uh, it was pitched from a development point of view, of course. I mean, that was our, was our job. And, we, and, and if you, re you probably don't remember, but... but um, the slogan for the Copenhagen COP that Ban Ki-moon came up with was seal the deal. That was this. So we thought, okay, we've got a deal then. I mean, this is our deal. We've got a deal for you, a global Green New Deal. And we went to see, I, I, we went to see him with the pugnacious head of DESA at that time, who was the former Chinese ambassador, uh, ambassador to Geneva, Ambassador Shah. And, we picked, and, and, and Ban Ki-moon and his entourage were completely uninterested in what we had to say about a, 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 a green... He was interested in a song with Ban Ki-moon. He wanted a song for the conference. That was very important for him. But he was not interested in a global green new deal. Um, so 10 years later... So I'm, it's funny for me, I'm revisiting this theme 10 years later. Um, and, and, and the context for us, of course, to some extent, is coming out of the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, a lot of expectations that there would be a change in the way in which the global economy would operate. I mean, for those that remember the London um, uh, G20 conference, you know, Bank, uh, uh, Gordon Brown talked about the need for a new Bretton Woods. Uh, Nicholas Sarkozy talked about a new, a, a new world order. So there was a lot of expectation. And 10 years later, of course, nothing has really changed when it comes to the workings of the global economy. We still live in this hyper-globalized world in which increasing numbers of working people feel squeezed by the pressures of hyper-globalization. And, and hyper-globalization is this world essentially of, of hot money and highly footloose capital. Footloose capital that trips around the world, sucking up uh, super profits, avoiding taxation, and essentially cre creating boom and busts wherever it, 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 it can uh, get the opportunity for so certain types of speculative uh, investment. So that's a world which, uh, on its flip side, is leading to 
uh, wages that are essentially stagnant, jobs that are increasingly insecure, very high levels of uh, debt, both government uh, and household, uh, and, and the erosion of public services. Uh, and that's true whether you're in Detroit or Delhi or Durban. It's, uh, these pressures are being felt by working people uh, across, uh, across the world. It's an age of anxiety, essentially. And the current um, global situation is certainly adding to those anxieties. Uh, the report, of course, has a whole chapter on the current state of the global economy. I'm not really going to talk about it other than to say I think there's a growing recognition that things are not going well. I mean, I was at the IMF meetings last week, and, and essentially there's an understanding, you know, 12 months ago when I was there, we were in a synchronized upturn. Everything was looking rosy. 12 months down the road, it's a synchronized downturn. Why? We're not really sure. They blame Trump. They blame Boris Johnson and Brexit. Uh, trade is the main... And, but I've, I've seen this for 10 years where the IMF and the World Bank predict that we've suddenly escaped from the excesses of the global crisis. Then, then, then something happens and we're in a de Then we're in an upturn. I mean, and so basically they don't know. I mean, the, the truth of the matter is they don't know what is going on and they don't really have a set of coherent solutions. And that's adding to the anxiety. There's a feeling that politicians everywhere, not just at the multilateral level, don't really have a handle on the kinds of pressures that, uh, uh, that describe this hyper-globalized uh, world in a way that can bring about a degree of, of, of uh, progress and balance. So this is the age of anxiety, I think. Um, and it's an age, this hyper-globalization model is essentially driven, as we see it, by not so much by wealth creation, although that's how it's kind of sold in, in popular uh, uh, jargon. It's sold as a kind of great model of wealth creation, but it's fundamentally a model of wealth extraction. Rent-seeking behavior is endemic in this hyper-globalized model. The 2017 Trade and Development Report tried to outline our understanding of that kind of rent-seeking uh, uh, culture that we think is, is characteristic of the hyper-globalized world. And of course, you know, this model of extraction is now extended to the environment. I mean, you can't blame, you cannot blame neoliberalism and financialization for climate change, but the kind of model that we now have in place across the world, this hyper-globalized model, is clearly exaggerating what were existing problems. And that's not just rising temperatures, but it's, it's the acidification of oceans, rising, rising uh, sea levels, it's soil degradation, it's deforestation, it's the loss of species across the world that I, I, I guess many of you people know far, far more about than I do. But this, this idea that the environment is now um, on the brink, I think, um, is, is, is a product of this um, age of extraction that we, we associate at least with, with hyper-globalization. And, I, and, and, the, uh, and the great fear now is that in an age of anxiety coupled with this age of extraction, the, f the, f the threat for younger people like yourselves and your, and your children and grandchildren is that we, we, this will also be an age of extinction. I mean, it's no accident that one of the big global movements is called the Extinction Rebellion because there's a fear that when you combine these pressures of uh, both economic and environmental and, and the lack of political direction, that, that, that you know, we face the kind of c catastrophic um, uh, scenarios that the, the IPCC, for one, has hardwired into many of its uh, models of, of, of global war warming. So, so that's the big context. I mean, what we've tried to do in, to some extent in this report, but more extensively in the previous two reports, is just to, to, to trace out the extent of inequality and insecurity, instability, indebtedness, and very importantly, insufficient investment, which I'll come back to, which we think characterize the hyper-globalization world. And we've, I mean, most of the discussion, at least in the economics profession, is to debate whether the big culprits for these kinds of problems are trade or technology. So you have a whole debate now that I'm sure many of you are familiar with about trade versus technology as the source of these uh, uh, um, symptoms and, and, and malaise in the global economy. We don't think that's a very useful way of framing 
the challenges of hyperglobalization. We certainly don't think the people left behind mantra is a particular, no one's left behind in a hyperglobalized world. We live in a world where, where everybody is touched by these, no one's left behind. Lots of people are thrown under the bus, but being thrown under the bus is a very different process than being left behind. The left behind is the, the liberal elite love that because there's this kind of idea of a shiny train that's kind of pulled and the poor people have, you've just forgotten about and they're kind of there kind of waving to you from the platform because you've forgotten. That, that's not the way in which hyperglobalization works in our, our world. So we're not, very, we're not very enamored with the people left behind mantra and it's certainly not good, popular, uh, good, good globalist versus bad populist. That's not the way in which we find um, uh, the, the discussion uh, usefully structured. What you have, in our opinion, and what we've tried to argue, is that you have a set of rules of the game and, that make up hyperglobalization around neoliberal policies, around highly financialized economies, and around very concentrated and often monopolized markets, which, is a, which have essentially rigged the rules of the game in favor of the few and to the disadvantage of the many. And that notion of a rigged game, which is not something peculiar to us, I mean, Stiglitz talks about it, Danny talks about it, is, is the way in which we think you should understand the nature of, of, of hyperglobalization. And, of course, you know, it's, that's coupled with this idea, a, fr a phrase I do like from a Chicago economist, ironically, I don't, I don't normally cite Chicago economists, but, but um, Luigi Zingales refers to what he calls the Medici vicious circle about the kind of interplay of economic power and political power, which is not unlike 16th century Florence, in which, you know, the bankers were able to manipulate the political structures of, of Florence to further uh, consolidate their economic power, and you get this vicious kind of circle in which economic and, and political uh, influence feed off each other and, and to the detriment of, and that's I think a good way of, of thinking about, about the world that we, we refer to as, as hyperglobalization. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of the kind of numbers, and we, but this is this is work I did with Kevin, so I want to kind of, I want to advertise it from the little booklet. Just a couple of ways of thinking about the, some of the problems that we talked about. The, the, the graph here on what we call the crocodile graph is. Most of the inequality debate is usually structured around household inequality and, and, and trying to make using the Gini coefficient and, and other ways of, of what, I mean, what that ignores is what we think is more important, which is functional inequality. That is the distribution of global income between wages, profits, and rents. And the, this, this diagram on, the, on, 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 on your right here is um, the, the orange line is the share of global income that goes to the top 2,000 transnational corporations, which you can see has been rising pretty sed steadily up two percentage points uh, between 95 and 2015, 2016. And the bottom green line is the share of labor income in total global income. And they essentially mirror each other. And, you know, Milanovic <coughs> made himself famous by coming up with the elephant graph on inequality that many of you probably know about, we thought we should kind of try and compete with that. So we have our crocodile graph about the predatory nature of hyperglobalization in which these very large firms have clearly uh, have been able to garner a huge amount, a huge increase of the, uh, a, a huge share of the increase in global income, essentially at the expense of, uh, of working families. So that's, that's a, a, the way in which we try and frame the inequality side of this story. The, the financialization side of the story, we, we measured financialize, financialization here as total external assets and liabilities, which we think is a better measure than simply capital flows. Um, I think what's important for this graph, because I'm going to come back to it, is the, is the dark green line, which is the share of um, gross fixed capital formation in output uh, over this period which is, I mean, again, financialization is sold as sophisticated bankers and financial institutions who know how to create a healthy investment climate that is good for investors and investment will feed productivity growth and you get this virtuous circle of, of driven by uh, uh, intelligent financial operatives with all their 
te their techniques, and that will be a healthy investment climate. And, and, you know, again, the evidence simply does not show this. It's e uh, investment across the, both the developed and large parts of the developing world has it, has it, have either been declining or stagnant during this pe period in which financial markets have become the dominant force in, in, in terms of organizing uh, in, in investment activity. So I, I'm going to come back to that story. One part of the story that I think is very important because it connects the current situation to this uh, long-term um, uh, issue of structural transformation and the Global Green New Deal, of course, is the issue of debt. And we have a whole chapter in this year's Trade and Development Report on the, on the challenges around uh, debt. Because debt, I mean, debt is both a glue, it holds the hyper-globalization model together. Growth is debt-driven in hyper-globalization. It's not being wage-driven or income-driven, it's being debt-driven. Um, so it's a kind of glue, of the, it's also the solvent of the model. So it's both a glue and the solvent, I think, is, is, um, is debt. Uh, the debt stock has risen 14-fold uh, uh, during the period of, of hyper-globalization. It's a huge increase. Most of, it, most of that has been private debt. I mean, lots of people think of debt as being a government problem or issue. Uh, in, this, in these graphs here, gov uh, public debt is the orange, private debt is the green. Hyperglobalization is an era of massive increases in, in, private, in, in private debt, and behind that is a deregulated financial system, shadow banking, highly speculative um, uh, financial uh, operations, and weak development outcomes. Because despite this huge surge in debt over this period, as I said, investment has not followed suit. It hasn't led to increases in productive uh, investment and, and the, I, I don't want to go into the details but in the, tr in the trade and development report this year we argue essentially that unless we deal with this problem you can forget sustainable development goals in most developing countries. Most, a lot of the certainly low income and many middle income countries given their current levels of debt uh, it's, it's simply impossible for them to meet the 2030 agenda over the next decade. Either they would have to themselves increase their debt levels beyond what they have now to, to orders of 200 or 300% of GDP, which would put huge pressures on these economies, or they'd have to grow at 10 to 15% a year if they were going to generate those resources domestically, and, they're not, and most of these countries are not going to do that. So we have a whole argument, which I'll come back to. Without debt relief, the Global Green New Deal and certainly the Sustainable Development Goals can be written off for most, or a large number of um, uh, developing countries in, uh, particularly low-income countries in, in sub-Saharan Africa. The, so that's, that's the economic background as we see it. That's not, it's not a very pretty one. It's not a particularly, it's a kind of, I watched The Joker the other, the other week, as a, as, and I thought, my God, it sounds a bit like us, this, this movie. I mean, it's about as bleak as you can get. So, so there's a certain bleakness to this to this, this story, and this of course is compounded by what you all know, and I don't really want to go uh, into the details of, of, the, of the problems of global warming and the environmental challenges. We were told to get kind of high-tech, so this is, my, this is my attempt at kind of high-tech power, PowerPoints, it's as high-tech as you're going to get from me, so enjoy it when you can. You, you, know, the, you know the details here, the increase in carbon dioxide, the, the, the number of, of, of years that have that have uh, the, the warmest years on, on record uh, being concentrated in the last uh, 20, 25 years. And of course, the, the important issue that, that you know, there's, there's a class dimension to the climate challenge. Inequality, that, you know, rich people have, and, and big wealthy firms have been the main progenitors of, 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 of um, carbon emissions, and, and that should never be forgotten. But, and then, and then this, is my, this is my fancy bit, just about the kind of headlines that you're all familiar with about, about droughts and forest fires and, and deforestation and, and, and all that and all, everything that we read in, our, and, and, and in the every, every day. And this is, a, this, I mean, if you want to read a book that does it far better than I can do, then David Wallace Wells' book on the uninhabitable earth is an excellent account of the way things, I mean, it's not even project, it's just about, it's a collection of, evidence that, that has taken place so far about the damage to the environment that we've, that w that w that we've seen. And, and it's, I mean, it's quite horrific in its own, in its own way. So, so I, we, we, it, it, unless we deal with this problem, then, you know, whether it's two or three or four degrees, 
the, the, the damage is, is, is quite shocking. So, we, so, so, that's the, so that's the background. Um, the great challenge for us and the great problem for us is that we understand that to deal with these problems, both the economic and the environmental, requires a massive investment push, in pub essentially in public goods of one kind or another. Um, and the numbers are huge. I mean, the World Bank has been talking about billions to trillions now for years. Uh, we've made an estimate of two to three trillion dollars a year in developing countries alone to deal with these kind of, e the, to, to fund the SDGs and to, to deal with the economic and the environmental challenges. Bernie Sanders, in his, in his own attempt to put a number on his own Green New Deal, $1.6 trillion a year uh, for the next 10 years. And so we know this is a huge financial challenge that, that, that we're talking about to, to get the kinds of investments needed to address these economic and environmental problems. And, and everyone knows that. Right? I mean, this is, everyone kind of acknowledges that uh, outside of a few kind of, you know, if you, I guess if you live in Alabama or somewhere, it may be different. But, but, um, but I mean, everyone knows this is a problem. And, and what we find disturbing about much of the current discussion in the um, dominant policy circles is a belief that somehow by employing the financial uh, instruments and techniques that have dominated financial markets under hyperglobalization, we can somehow rejig these to deliver the kinds of public goods that we think are necessary to um, underpin a global Green New Deal. And, and this securitization, inclusive investment, the, my favorite of all, doing well by doing good and the Clinton Foundation and, and, and Bill Gates, and all and investment as an a, infrastructure as an asset class. Now, some of these things are useful techniques, uh, without a shadow of a doubt, financially. But the idea that, the, that, um, that somehow private capital solves public good problems, first of all, is, is simply not grounded in any evidence whatsoever. I mean, there's no public-private part. I mean, the World Bank endlessly spits out public-private partnerships. The scale of these things, despite the fact that they've been endlessly talking about these things for the last, is insignificant compared with the kind of numbers that we and they uh, are talking about. And the, the idea that somehow they, they can entice people with, with, with large amounts of uh, financial capital to somehow start delivering this, it, 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 it's certainly not, it's not present in existing evidence. And all the evidence that we've seen is that these kinds of techniques lead to more inequality and less sustainability, which are the very challenges that the Agenda 2030 and the Global Green New Deal are meant to be addressing. So we, we just find this argument, the dominant paradigm, maximizing finance, as the World Bank calls it, to be utterly unpersuasive and indeed in some respects dangerous. So, and, and chapter two of the report is an attempt just to spit that out in some way. And that's where the, the alternative, which we think is the Green New Deal, um, uh, uh, kicks in. And as I said, New Deal is very conscious. Well, I use it consciously. We had a debate about whether this was a, an appropriate term globally when we kind of was thinking how to frame our argument. I, 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 I mean, the old New Deal had four or five elements, and they all begin with the letter R, which is good for me because I'm losing my memory as I get older. So I need to be... A so, you know, the old New Deal was about relief, unemployment relief, recovery, regulation, particularly finance, redistribution, and eventually, in, in the 40s, uh, Roosevelt got around to the issue of rights, particularly economic rights. So, so those, are the, and, and, and those are the things we need to be talking about, I think, in the Green New Deal and in the global Green New Deal. Re reclaiming policy from footloose capital, delivering economic justice and from those thrown under the, the whole idea of a just transition, boosting productive investment, and reversing decades of, of environmental uh, degradation and decay. And, and, and essentially, most of the talk that I've seen about the Green New Deal has a set of, whether, that, whether that's Ocasio-Cortez and, and the squad here in the United States or the Europeans who have just created a commission on a European Green New Deal or people in the UK and the, the Labour Party about the need for a, who have also embraced the Green New Deal idea actually at the last conference. And they all have more or less the same ingredients, right? I think these are the ingredients of the Green New Deal. End austerity, a big public spending uh, uh, agenda, particularly on transforming energy, both the efficient use of energy and the shift to 
uh, renewable energy. So th obviously that's at the center of this. Redistribution, redistributing income through progressive taxation, uh, both household and, and corporate. Again, I think everyone talks about that. The need for industrial policy. You can't make, we don't believe that you know, market incentives can make the kinds of structural transformations that we are talking about, whether that's in energy or transportation or, or agriculture, that you need a, a conscious, thought through uh, industrial policy strategy to make this kind of, uh, of, of, of transition um, and to bring in private investment. This is not an anti-private investment agenda, the Green New Deal. It's often presented as that. Somehow it's anti-private sector. It's not. I mean, for me, the Green New Deal is about a smaller role for private finance and a bigger role for private investment, along, of course, with public investment. But, but you want to reduce private investment, you want to increase, uh, uh, reduce private finance, increase uh, private investment, but you need industrial policy to make sure that it's going into the kind of right sectors that will, that will have the big bang for the buck. Public banks, I, this is work that Kevin, of course, and, and people here have been doing extensively, and we have a whole chapter on that in, in the report. I mean, we, you know, the credit system has to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Of that, there is no doubt. And you can't leave that to, in our opinion, to, to the private institutions, whether that's actual or shadow banks. You need to re-engage with, the, with, with public banks to be able to do this effective, and you, you need much more active central banks. And there's a whole debate, interestingly, going on now about the, whether, whether central banks should be independent or not. I mean, if you raise the issue of central banks shouldn't be independent five years ago, you would be laughed into the, into the Charles River, from, certainly from the other side of the Charles River, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, 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 but now it's come back as an issue, because, partly because uh, central banks aren't actually able to solve the economic problems that they're meant to solve. I mean, the, the people like Draghi and Mark Carney are happy to admit that monetary policy cannot solve the economic imbalances that we face. But there's a whole issue about the role of central banks as regulators or, uh, and channelers of, of credit that we think needs to be part of the conversation about um, uh, investing in a global Green New Deal. So that's a, I think everyone talks about that. And of course, policy coordination. You can't have industrial policy, trade policy, macro policy, financial policy, all doing its own thing in this kind of uh, uh, framework. They have to be more or less working together. And you need institutions and, 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 and a narrative that, that looks at these things uh, in close association with each other. So policy co So I think these are all the kind of, all Green New Deals, wherever they're going to take place are going to have these components uh, uh, as, 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 key to their, as key to their success. And we've tried to model this in the report. We, we, we have a global model in UNCAD, a Keynesian model. It's demand-driven. It's not the kind of thing you would get from the World Bank or the IMF or the OECD, but it's a fully consistent uh, global model. And we, we tried to model these ingredients just to say, look, this is, this is not kind of economic, there's a logic behind this kind of argument, and if you, you, can, you can tell us a credible story that increases components of this and generates what you want to do. It generates more employment, it ge generates higher wages, uh, and, and it decarbonizes the economy. You can, you can tell a consistent economic story uh, at the global level that kind of delivers the things that we want to see as part of a consistent uh, Green New Deal. It can't be, and we, this is where we get into the heart of the story, it can't, be, it's not it can't be done with individual countries doing their own thing uh, 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 in isolation. It can't be, uh, you need to coordinate this kind of thing at the, at the global uh, and the regional levels, and you need to have the developing world as part of it. Because if the developing world is not part of it, you know, even if the U.S., even if, you know, you know wave a magic wand and Ocasio-Cortez is the president of the United States and Corbyn is the prime minister of Great Britain and the European Commission is dominated by Timmermans and his Green New Deal Commission, even if that happened and even if these people all embarked on this Green New Deal, that would still be one out of every 10 of the world's population. If the other nine of, of the 10's world population are not part of this story, it, you're not going to solve these problems. That's, at least to us, that's obvious. It's where, it's where growth is going to take place. It's where demogra 
demographic increases are going to take place. So you can't do this as a northern, you can't simply do the Green New Deal as a, as a northern agenda. It can't be a northern agenda, it has to be a global agenda. And this is where the problems begin, because we have a multilateral system right now that is essentially kaput. It's not able to deal with the problems it was set up to deal with. Can't deal with trade disputes, can't deal with potential currency wars, can't deal with debt problems, can't, can't deal with technology transfer issues. All these, the things that it was kind of meant to be doing, it can't do, let alone imposing this challenge linked to the environment. So, so this is obviously for people like myself and Kevin who want, who want to make this argument, the, the, the nature of the multilateral system itself is a concern. So there's a question then, and it's a very legit, should we be going back to 1944? I mean, I was uh, watching, it was the 75th anniversary of the IMF and the, well, about 75th anniversary of Bretton Woods uh, this year. So they didn't really celebrate it. And, and, and rightly so, because actually there's nothing to celebrate. Because what these people do today is nothing like what the people in Bretton Woods thought they were doing uh, 70, 75 years ago. I mean, I, I love this. This is, this is Keynes's quote from... The, the letter that he wrote to Roosevelt, I think, in 1937, where he, where he pats Roosevelt on the back and he said, you know, this is, I, I understand what you're trying to do, which is, which is to restore faith in the wisdom and the power of government. And, and in a way, the Bretton Woods was going to take that to the international level. I think, that, I think the people behind the Bretton Woods understood that that was what they were trying to do. And we kind of know that because that's what Morgenthau said. And Mo Morgenthau was the... Secretary of the Treasury in, 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 in during the Bretton Woods negotiations, he has to go to the Committee on Banking and Currency to defend what they'd agreed to and to convince the lawmakers that they should sign up to it, because if they didn't sign up to it, it was dead. So he goes to the Committee on Banking, I think it's called the Committee on Financial Services today, yeah. probably, but, but, it's the, but it was called the Committee on Banking and Currency in 45, and, he, and it's a beautiful little four-page summary of what he thought people were trying to do back in 44. And this is what he thought. That these were the th basically the three things that he w understood was the uh, essence of the Bretton Woods agenda. Subordinating finance to the real economy, and particularly you can't have a healthy trading system without a healthy financial system. Um, you can't have political independence with e without economic independence. We, in UNCAD, we pride ourselves on being the inventors of the term policy space. And, and certainly we put it back onto the agenda in the early 2000s when no one else was talking about it. I, I know the history. Now everyone talks about it as if it's just obvious, but we can pride ourselves of putting it back on. But it's, not a, it's, an, it's an American adventure. It's a, certainly it's Morgan, this is what Morgan Thau was talking about. You need a multilateral system that can ensure governments have the policy space and the instruments available to them that can deliver on the kind of agenda that they promise to their citizens. And if you don't have that economic degree of economic independence, political independence will, will create all kinds of, of pathologies. And you can't, and the third point I think from, from that Morgenthau insisted on is that you can't have inclusive development in a world of what he calls economic aggression and bullying. The terms that he used, the, 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 big, the big and the strong, bullying the small and the weak. And, and you need to coordinate properly to ensure that that doesn't happen. And, and Morgenthau insists on his presentation to the banking committee that that has to be an integral feature of a healthy... And, and the, we don't have any of these things now. In fact, it's the opposite, right? We have a, we have a, a real economy that is subordinate to the financial economy. We have, we have an endless attempt to cut down on policy space. Kevin's done all the work showing the extent, and UNCTAD too, showing the extent to which policy space has been cut back uh, during the ne neoliberal era. And unilateralism, you know, I don't have to tell people here, I guess, that unilateralism is becoming a, the norm in a lot of international economic relations. And it's not just the hegemon, although the hegemon is... Is, is particularly abusive in this, in, this re, in this regard, but it's not just the US and Trump that has, that has um, adopted that kind of way of thinking. Um, so so, so that's, that's, the, that's the problem that we, I think, face, trying to pitch a case for, a, the, for the multilateralism. And, and I think these principles are the kind of principles we want to see, and we've talked about similar ones in the work that myself and Kevin have done in the little booklet out there. 
but you know, just having a better set of principles, I don't think, is enough. And what this report has tried to do is, is to set out some of the kind of institutional changes that we think will be necessary at the multilateral level if we're going to get a kind of structure that is capable of delivering uh, the global Green New Deal as we, as we, um, as we identify it. And, and these are some of the ones that we talk about in particular. Obviously, we do want to see more policy space. You know, we need to revise free trade agreements, uh, bilateral investment treaties. We need, we, and they, they, these have to support capital controls. You can't do this kind of model that we're talking about with, uh, with footloose capital. You need to be able, governments need to be able to control the inflow and outflow of capital. You need capital controls in this. And you can't have these under most free trade agreements and bilateral investment treaties, you know. We, we like to say, I mean, I, at least I like to say that, you know, the, I mean, free trade agreements, and this was, this was the 2018 report, really, um, where we talk about this illusion of free trade. You know, um, Voltaire used to, it, Voltaire made his famous statement about the Holy Roman Empire, right? It was not holy, it was not Roman, and it wasn't an empire. And we say more or less the same things about free trade agreements. It's not about freedom, it's about tying the hands of governments and organized labor. It's not about trade, it's about everything but trade and intellectual property and, and standards and all, and, and all the cases. These are not trade agreements. Uh, and they're not agreements because there's a huge amount of lobbying and arm twisting that goes, particularly of developing countries, that goes into their uh, uh, design and implementation. So I think Voltaire would have, uh, have appreciated the parallel. Um, so, but more policy space is a necessary part of the agenda that we see Clamping down on corporate tax evasion, it's become, fortunately, there is a serious discussion going on. The OECD does its work on BEPS. We don't think it's enough. We want to see some sort of, uh, of, of, of unitary um, uh, uh, taxation system. I think the, 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 the OECD and the UN tax fund are kind of pushing in that direction. Uh, and so there's kind of some encouragement in that. In that, although the recent proposals by the OECD have been heavily criticized by a number of... Um, of, of uh, civil society organizations, I know that. But, but obviously, clamping down on illicit financial flows, tax avoidance is critical because of the kind of resources that are lost uh, to, to, to uh, tax avoidance. As I said before, some kind of debt jubilee, debt relief, debt restructuring is imperative. Um, all the talk about the rules-based multilateral, li the rules-based international liberal order, which is how it's all celebrated down in Washington. They don't ha we don't have any rules on dealing with sovereign debt uh, uh, problems in the way that you have bankruptcy rules to deal with uh, national uh, level uh, bankruptcy problems. We need some sort of sovereign debt workout mechanism. We, UNCAD has argued this for 30 years. It's still not really on the agenda, but I, without it, I don't see uh, realization for many countries. We, we argue for some sort of global climate bank. We don't think the World Bank and the IMF can deal, deal with the scale of the problem, uh, have the skills to do it, or, or indeed were built to do it. They were built to do other things, and, and we, we, we think it's probably time to really seriously talk about a dedicated uh, global climate uh, bank. Green Marshall Plan, which I think comes from Elizabeth Warren, you can't do, you, technology transfer has to be put on, on, on sensible terms. Ideally on, you know, I mean, developing countries would ideally argue free, but, that, but at least on terms that are affordable and meaningful. It's, it's got to be part of this agenda. I think Warren, to her credit, has talked about this in her, uh, green, her, her green Marshall Plan. Um, of course, the Marshall Plan was not loans. It was, it was grants. People forget that sometimes. It was a grant-based uh, a financing model. I'd like to see more of that myself in this context. But, but the, having the discussion about these kinds of issues, technology transfer adaptation, is critical, we think. Um, um, and we, we make a pitch in the report also for um, regional trade and financial arrangements, possibly as a, as a stopgap measure before we get to reform of the multilateral system. Given the politics of the day, there may be more opportunities for actual regional arrangements that can deal with these problems uh, rather than multilateral. But, so those are, the kind of, those are the kind of measures that we've tried to lay out in the report that we think are a necessary part of the, um, of the, of the, of the, uh, gr of the Global Green New Deal. And a last point, because it always comes up, right? Oh, this is all time in the sky. We can't afford it. We don't have the money. We don't have the money. We had the money to save banks, but we don't have the money to save the planet, right? 
And, and you know, you look at the, I mean, it's a kind of a strange argument given the, the uh, prospective costs that are attached to uh, global warming. I mean, these kind of numbers from 70 to 550 trillion are the numbers from the IPCC, depending on, on your scenario about, uh, about rising trend. I mean, you know, so, so just from an insurance policy point of view, spending 50 trillion dollars, if, if the potential cost is 500, is not a, it's a fairly rational kind of, uh, 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 of calculation. But we, we think it's a false calculation anyway, because the resources are there. This is not a resource. This is not a problem of lack of financial resources. Change your macro policies, and you can begin to generate domestic resources to fill these gaps. You can't do this under austerity, you know, whether you think austerity is expansionary or not. I mean, this to me is a silly argument. But, but macro mismanagement has cost trillions of dollars, uh, 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 to, in, not only in developing countries, but in developed too. The problem of subsidies, we know the scale of fossil fuel subsidies, of agricultural subsidies, that governments spend today. They, they need to take these resources not, and spend them differently. Uh, it's not that they shouldn't be spending them on agriculture, it's just that they should be spending them uh, dis uh, differently. Abused resource, the whole problem of, of, of tax evasion is something that, as I said, um, um, uh, has, to be, has to be tackled. Um, credit has to be part of the, the world. Since 1980, the global economy has generated, on average, between five and six trillion dollars a year in credit each year. The problem is that a large chunk of that credit is simply used to grease a out-of-control financial system. It's all about internal financial transactions. It doesn't go, doesn't go into the real economy. It's not invested in, in productive investment in, in, the, in the brown economy, let alone the green economy. But we have this mechanism. This credit system is an amazing public mechanism that is used to mobilize resources today when you don't have the savings in place. You don't need the savings in place to be able to generate the resources to make these investments. We have this credit machine. That is, that is out there, that if properly managed, can deliver huge resources to deliver the, the investments we're talking about. And for developing countries, we have to have the serious discussion about overseas development assistance and aid. We know, we know developed countries have failed to meet their obligations on that. Three and a half trillion dollars since 2002 on our calculations. If they'd met, they're not 0.7 percent target. So this is, so, so we don't think it's a, it's a political question. It's not a financial question. The, the challenge of the Global Green New Deal is, a, is, a, is, a, is for us a political... And, and it's, a, it's my favorite quote from Thomas Paine. And apparently it was Ronald Reagan's favorite quote, which I find difficult to believe, but maybe not. You know, we have it in our power to begin the world all over again, was, was Paine's quote for the American... Uh, independence revolution. So this is a, to, you know, when people say, oh, it's not very American, this is a very American agenda for me. It's, it's what Thomas Paine would have been happy to put his name to, I think, if he was still around and thinking about the challenges of the 21st century. So that's what, that's the story. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. I have to close this, right? If you don't want to read the, if you don't want to sit through six hours of the movie, you can read the kind of abridged version, which is what myself and Kevin tried to put together um, a few months ago um, in a short, succinct, politically not too correct kind of uh, writing of, of, of this story that we hope uh, is, is, is captures the message but is, is readable and digestible a little bit more uh, easily. Thanks, uh, Richard. Thank you. Sarah, are we live streaming still for the Q&A, so folks need, to, folks need to use this. So what, what, we, what we do here at the center is we'll take two or three questions, and then we'll let the speaker respond to them and uh, do, do a couple rounds of those. And uh, our rule, sorry, I, you always raise your hand. I always I say the same thing. Students first because they pay our salary. So we have to have a, a, a question by a student. Um, and if we don't get one, I, I call on somebody. <laughs> I'm not a student from here, I'm from the econ department, but uh, I find the study quite interesting. Uh, going to real politic in the short term, there is any kind of agreement, any kind of international uh, instance, agreement, for instance, this, the, the result for, from the COP 
from Cancun to, to, to Paris that can be used in this kind of uh, like a migration to, fin to, to finance this kind of process in, their, in, in your perspective? Students, and I, you I'm sorry, uh, please introduce yourselves so we can yeah. all get to okay. Yeah, I'm uh, Rich Rosen, a retired from the TELUS Institute in Boston. Um, so I just want to congratulate you and Kevin for this work. Uh, it's you the, ended the biggest Yeah, I, I understand. It's fabulous. It's, I mean, it's the first talk I've ever agreed with, uh, you know, 150%, frankly. Um, but just then one added point, which may be a sort of friendly amendment to your analysis, it seems to me ultimately, and I've spoken at conferences making this point, that th there's a deeper internal contradiction in, in capitalism which controls most of the world economy, which is if, again, labor doesn't get um, a share of, of income greater than the increase in labor productivity in the long run, then it's going to capital, which is what we see in the history, you know, crystal clear at this point, right, for 40 years. So, so it seems to me that's sort of uh, consistent with your point and a motivation, of course, for the fact that we need mostly public investment in the future. And, and again, the problem, in my view, with most um, private capital investment is they expect too high a rate of return that the world just can't pay. Do you agree with that or not? Hi, uh, Becky Ray, postdoc here at the GDP Center. I love this as always. I want to pose a question to you that was posed to me yesterday when I presented like a 10 minute version of the Geneva Principles uh, to a bunch of NGOs in DC, uh, and which underpins a lot of our work. It's always there in the background. Um, the Bretton Woods institutions have been successfully lobbied over the last 75 years to green their processes, to lend to greener and more inclusive processes, especially in the infrastructure space. But as a corollary, they've become a smaller and smaller slice of that, of that space, in part because uh, inclusive processes take a really long time. And finance ministries want something fast before the next election. Um, and these old projects, especially brown infrastructure like coal, those plans, pre-feasibility studies have been sitting on shelves for decades. They're fast, easy to, to implement. Um, time is actually worth more than money in an electoral process cycle. So how, great, the Bretton Woods institutions have been cleaning up their act, losing share of the market, and time is a big part of that equation. If they're gonna have any chance of living up to some of those initial visions for a multilateral process. Uh, they have to be able to be relevant to what developing countries want right now, and, and what that is, in part, is really fast implementation because of the electoral cycle and because of, of old technologies versus new technologies. And I don't really have an answer for that, so I thought I'd throw it to you. Thanks. Take those three and then we'll do another round. Okay, because I think they're all pretty We think this should be public investment-led, but the aim is to also to crowd in the. I mean, it's to crowd in the private. I mean, the, I mean, once the public sector drives in a certain direction, the opportunities for reasonable profit making should be there, right? I mean, that's that's a kind of classic Keynesian crowding in story. So, so that's that's what we try and model in the report, and we we do think it's a a, a consistent uh, argument. But yet you have to control finance to be able to do it because the, the, the returns for um, corporations, I mean particularly corporations, it's not just, we're not just talking about banks here, is driven by what they can make short term through asset price appreciation. That's the model, right? That's the, that's the financialization model. Until you, until you get your hands on that and control that, it's going to be very difficult to get this kind of virtuous circle between a big public investment drive and private investment crowded in. So that's the story that we think should be told um, in, terms of, in terms of the uh, kind of classic Keynesian dynamics that underpins our, uh, our model. And we think it's credible. I mean, you know, we do think it's a, a credible story. You know, you look at the multiplier effects, you look at the tax revenues that are generated as a consequence of of both of, of, of uh, uh, higher incomes, but also shifting 
uh, incomes from profits to to you know we know that that you know working people spend more money you know you generate more tax revenue as those expenditures take place and, uh, than if you if it's hoarded by wealthy individuals in tax havens in Switzerland or the Bahamas. I, I, so so there's a whole bunch of kind of classic dynamics that we think are consistent um, uh, uh, with the story. Uh, I mean, there are certain pressures that are taken. I mean, in a certain way, the Bretton Woods Institute. You know, they when they lost they they lost their in what they should have been. They were set up to do long-term investment mainly in infrastructure. Now it was old infrastructure, sure. But they lost that in the early 1980s when they went to policy-based lending and the whole structural adjustment programs. And they, they, you know, they, they, the percentage of what you would call you know, classic Bretton Woods uh, investment is tiny now. I mean, Kevin probably knows the numbers on infrastructure. Now, the good thing, of course, is who's, who's kind of filled the gap recently? China's filled the gap recently. You know, I mean, what, what, you know, the Belt and I mean, there are lots of issues on the Belt and Road, but this is new pressures that is forcing a different kind of discourse about long-term multilateral lending onto the agenda. And, and they've changed as a, I mean, they've already been changing as a consequence. You know, I mean, you've heard noises about them getting at least to do co-financing with some of these institutions to get back into the business of infrastructure lending in a, in a bigger way than they've been in the past. I mean, you want that to be green. But, but so so that's, a, that's another pressure, I think, that's coming uh, uh, from, from outside on the on the multilateral institutions, and you do hear, yeah, you know, it, you know I, I never, I mean, I go to the IMFC twice a year, uh, you know, and it's, it's, it's like a cult, basically, you know, it's a cult, essentially, it's not a committee, it's a cult, and everyone says more or less the same thing, and if someone says something different, there's a kind of uncomfortable silence in the room, you know, that, that, you know, a Kisilov comes along and says, uh, says something different. Um, so, but you know, some, you know, Carney has started to talk about the role of central bank and what's and and they've got they've created this green, this network of greening. A lot of it is a lot of it is quite narrowly focused on de-risking models. And but but it's a it's a you know to his credit he's kicked off a conversation that has forced central begun to force central bankers to think about their role in this kind of agenda. And and so these changes are happening. These are, they're not happening on the scale that we think is necessary or at the speed we think is necessary. But there are, I think there are changes afoot. I, I think the other thing, you know, that we have to focus on and, and really sell and do, I think Kevin's doing great work on this, and, and uh, on the role of national development banks in this story has to be scale. What does it mean really to scale up in, in terms of the challenges that I've set up? What does it mean to scale up national development banks to be able to deliver the resources for this kind of transition? That's, I think, you know, if we're not confident that the multilateral system is going to make the changes at the speed required, then we're going to have to really encourage policymakers at the national and regional level to take these old mechanisms far more seriously and think about what role they have in a, in a serious agenda like that. I think that's a real, that's a real initiative that, and that's a worthwhile area of research and activism that, that, that needs to be uh, focused on. I, I really believe that. Uh, and, and, the, and the Europe, you know, this talk of the European Investment Bank, uh, Adnan, you may know that more than I do, you know, this talk of them moving in this direction, they've certainly made noises about, about getting out of dirty industries, you know, but then the Germans then come in. It's not, I mean, there's lots of European politics at play in that, but, but there, are, there are movements in that direction, yeah. Another round. A research professor with the party. Central bank independence is the holy grail. Nothing can, you know, stand against that. Industrial policy is a dirty word. It cannot be used about, you know, creates a 
Distinguished guest here. Uh, looks like we have a couple more. This is not for projecting, it's just for the live stream. <laughs> uh, well, uh, Richard, as you, uh, Adnan Amin, I'm about to take up a fellowship across the river and hope not to fall in the river at some point. Um, as you know, we've been discussing this for many years and we're very much aligned on the analysis. But for me, what always remains as a gap in this discussion is the political economy of all of this and how decisions get made. And, and that, for me, is a fundamental issue. I, I think we can agree that in terms of investment, growth, decarbonization, everything that we've said makes a huge amount of sense. But how does it play? And I think there are there's a bit of a bind and there's a bit of a disruption going on. The bind is, and was for me very interestingly summed up by Vladimir Putin three weeks ago in Moscow at the Russian Energy Week, where the journalist, they set up a Western journalist to ask him questions and so he was asking him, you're a critic of Western liberal democracy and you think that the model is failing. Look at what is happening in the West. How are these people that you don't like populists getting elected? What has happened in terms of people getting left behind? The whole idea of liberal democracy was to be inclusive. So you've created a system with rules and rights in developed countries, but you haven't lived up to your responsibilities in terms of your global role. So we have a flow of refugees coming from the South, and you're stuck with your human rights obligations and refugee rights obligations, and you're crying about immigration because it's a consequence of what you didn't do in the past in terms of a globalized economy. And I think that sums up the d dilemma in terms of what the governance issue is. And, and I'm glad to hear, Kevin, you're working on economic governance issues because that's where it comes down. How is it going to happen in developed economies where the preponderance of financial capital, the financialization of the economy, and the impact of financial capital on political decision making is that a point where it's very difficult to see a way around how this will be addressed through, apart from civil strife and so on? So are we headed in that direction? And the second is, you know, I was very much aligned with UNCTAD on these issues in the past, you know, making resources available to developed countries, ODA. 
But if you look at the record of ODA, it's been an absolute dismal failure for the last 50 years. Absolute failure. In fact, I think the impact of ODA in many ways, which reflects bilateral political interests rather than interest in supporting development, has led to a situation where we've had development uh, which is totally misaligned with national needs taking place in many of these countries. So if we're merely talking about scaling up ODA without addressing the governance issues in the South, I think we're missing a big part of the picture. Uh, um, okay, I mean, uh, again, the similar issues around governance. Um, to start with the, uh, with the aid issue, I mean, behind the aid issue, of course, is a bigger issue of tr the net transfer of resources. And uh, actually, ODA, and we, we, we do the exercise in this, in this report, too. The, you know, the net transfer of resources remains from south to north. Right. And an ODA does not compensate. I mean, we do a simple exercise in this report that people have forgotten about. You know, developing in a world of open, of relatively open uh, capital accounts and, and large cross-border flows of capital, um, developing countries have to hold reserves to protect themselves from uh, the, the threat of sudden stops and, and, and withdrawals of, of capital. Um, and when you look at the uh, cost of the capital, of, of, of attracting the capital to the south, and compare that with the returns that they make on the capital that they hold in foreign assets as reserves, it's something like $450 billion a year is transferred from the south to the north simply as a consequence of that mechanism. And there are, that ignores issues of, 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 of in terms of trade and illicit financial flows. So aid has always been, I mean, it's, it's never been sufficient to deal with the kind of problems of, that's true. Uh, or even so, I, I'm not as completely negative a view about the evidence. I mean, there is evidence that shows that ODA has, still has long-term positive effects, regardless of the nature of the governance of it. But, that, but, but I mean, I think you've got to keep in mind that, that asymmetry still when, when we're talking uh, about the the aid question. I mean, but, you know, the, the, the bigger question, and in, yeah, I mean, this is the, the great challenge of, of, the, of, the, of the politics of, of this kind of transition. And, you know, you would hope, given, given, that the, given that the rhetoric is that this is an existential threat, and everyone says it, right? When we've, we, the, the, when we've looked, I mean, Bretton, including Bretton Woods, when we've had big institutional changes in the past, it's come out of crisis. I mean, you need a crisis to a kind of real tangible, the fight against fascism, uh, economic depression, global economic depression. You need this tangible crisis that somehow, you know, forces politicians and policymakers to do the right thing, right? Now, the, and so there is a question here because the nature of the environmental crisis is not, a, I mean, arguably the threat is greater, but it's not as current as the threat of the rise of fascism or an economic downturn on a depression on a depression scale so so is it possible to you know respond to this in a rational are politicians going to be able to respond to this challenge in a rational way and to deliver on what they themselves in terms of their own rhetoric acknowledge to be an existential threat that's, that's exactly your question i think and um I, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm a great fan of Bertolt Brecht's quote, you know, because things are the way they are, things won't stay the way they are. Um, and, and you just, I mean, I hope, you, you, you hope. I mean, you know, you, you, have to, you have to have, I mean, you know, for example... I, mean, I, I strongly believe if, if Warren or Sanders gets in, um, is, is into power in a year's time, that will, have a, that will have global ramifications that go well beyond Washington around these issues. Whether it's enough, I don't know. So, you know, these one-off political changes can have these very large uh, ramifications. I think the Europeans at some point, to me the great tragedy in this debate is Europe. It's not Trump, it's not the United States. I mean, Europe has historically, at least in the post-war era, underpinned a more progressive international agenda. That's, you know, that was true in the 50s and the 60s. Europe is now, you know, it's... it's, it's navel-gazing, it's more neoliberal than the United States in many respects. 
it, it lacks, the, the, the commission <laughs> dominates the agenda in, a, in I, what I would consider a fairly reactionary way. And, and, but it, it can't last. I mean, Europe is falling, it, its own project is falling apart. Its own project is falling apart for some of the reasons that you said. They can't handle the inconsistencies and imbalances that they've created as a consequence of this very single-minded approach to economic integration. And, 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 and I, you know, I don't know what will happen with the, with the current shift and, I mean, the, the rise of Green parties. We just saw it in, what, what was the last, there was an election recently. Switzerland, oh yeah, God, that's my, where I'm living. That's, I should remember that. Um, Switzerland, there's been this transfer. I mean, you know, the Greens are now, you know, make, so. Now, I'm not, you know, there are Greens and Greens, as you know, I think. It's not, it's not a kind of homogenous political grouping. But, but you know, this is, these, are ch these are changes that, you know, do carry some degree of optimism that you have, that, that you can Businesses, you, and, and on top of that, you know, the economics of, I mean, you know, what people like Draghi, people like Carney are, are saying, look, you know, they're, they're, they're beginning to panic. If there is an economic shock sometime in the Western world in the next 12 months, they're saying we do not have the firepower to handle this problem. And, and you're going to have to, don't count on, on, on bankers and, 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 and negative interest rates, and, and this is not going to do the job this time around. And so that is forcing onto the, you know, it's forcing fiscal policy back onto the discussion. Once you've got the discussion of fiscal policy, then you start to talk about, well, what kind of public spending is actually appropriate? In the, and so kind of opportunities, one hopes, kind of open themselves up to have that kind of discussion in a more rational way. I, I, I'm, I, you know, it's easy to be, it is very easy to be pretty um, despondent given political... Yeah, exactly. And you identified what those seats are. And I think that the uh, prospect of debt in the system since the last financial crisis hasn't been disclosed. We basically fired all the groups we had for uh, financial management some time ago. Uh, there is huge amounts of collateralized debt in the system that nobody knows what has happened to it. Uh, there are indicators that we're moving into a position where that kind of And we don't have the, the monetary instrument to deal with it anymore. That's one. The other is, if you look at the disruption that is happening in terms of geopolitics and the rise of China in industry and industrialization, I spent a lot of time in China speaking to a lot of Chinese decision makers. But if you look at how industries were displaced, the advent of artificial intelligence, the application of 5G, this is where all the Chinese are in position. They are. Five years of bureaucracy and intergovernmental meetings and mid-level careers, bureaucrats from different governments quarreling with each other, and they managed manage ninety million dollars in five years. The Asian Infrastructure Bank, in the first year, disbursed not much program, disbursed two billion dollars. And you have a new model of development financing, which is not the destabilizing model of the Bretton Woods institution, which was we will give you the consultants. We will uh, oversee you, we will look at all the documentation, you have to take at least half the cost of the project in terms of the bureaucratic overhead from our institutions, etc. And then we will sit on your neck and make it very difficult for you to implement any of these projects. To the Chinese saying, if we render you, this is much, how much you owe us, this is how you have to pay it back, and go ahead and see if you succeed in the project so we can get our money back. And so it's, it's a different kind of thinking, and I think one needs to look at the design of these international financial institutions like the IMF and the bank, because it is not up there. Uh, you have uh, you know, financial experts in national governments and developing countries who are better than the economists, the IMF, and the bank. 
So uh, I think there is really a point where something very fundamental has to begin to change in the outcome. I mean, it's what the so bank and the fund would... But just, I mean, because I, I got... Right. I mean, the, the fund. Of, I mean, I mean, behind the, the Chinese model is the Chinese is the Chinese state, right? It's an activist state. It's what we would call a developmental state. I mean, you can make all kinds of criticisms, and there are problems with the Chinese model. Actually. I don't want to be roast into about it, but it's a transformative state. So, so the question then is, can, you know, and we know that the Bretton Woods institutions have spent the last 40 years dismantling that kind of state wherever they found it in the developing world. That's, that, that was their agenda. That's why they, you know, dismissing the role of development banks, uh, dismissing industrial policy as, as just about picking winners and failing, uh, uh, it, although now they're going back to it. The IMF has suddenly rediscovered that industrial policy might have a role to play. And part of that is responding to China, right? I mean, the Americans, not, I mean, at least thoughtful policymakers in this country, you know, they, they will say, look, we, need, we kind of need to do what China do. We need to rediscover that kind of model because we, that's, that's our model too. I mean, you know, the military-industrial complex in its, for all its failings was that kind of relationship, a powerful state using industrial policy, using subsidies, using financing mechanisms of one kind or another to build up its, you know, its military hardware. Now, can it kind of go back to that model, turn it around, and deal with the problems of, a, of an emerging uh, superpower that is focused much more on civilian technology, which is what, it, I mean, despite all the talk about how Huawei and whatever, it's about civilian technology. So that's, you know, that, and there is a discussion, I think, going on in the United States about, you know, re recovering that American tradition of an activist state that is willing to come from, you know, it's a Hamiltonian tradition, right? It's the old discussion of the Hamiltonian tradition of, of using industrial policy in this country. So I, I'm not, you know, I'm not, I, I believe that, I believe, and the Europeans are certainly having that discussion now. They're certainly having that discussion. Even the, even, even the remnants of Mrs. Thatcher's Tory party are talking about the need for industrial policy in the United Kingdom. So, I mean, that debate has moved on. beyond that argument personally uh, uh, now. Whether we've, whether we've really kind of honed it into the challenges that we're talking about, that's another question. But I think the discussion, no, no one in their right mind thinks that you can do this kind of structural transformation in the absence of industrial policy. I, I, and, um, there are people, I mean, I was, there was someone from your part of the world in the IMFC, a senior politician who was asked to comment on what they were doing and, he, and his, his basic position was, we are looking for private solutions to public problems. That's how he defined his agenda. And I thought, I, I thought, give him 12 months and they'll be capping to this institution uh, with, with, with riots on the streets, probably, because that's what we're seeing already. Um, so, I, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, you know, so I, I do think there is a change of narrative that we need to find ways of of capitalizing on with the kind of research that we are doing. I, I, I mean, I, and China, I mean, China, for, I mean, because obviously we also work closely with China on the, and China is opening up that discussion in a number of ways, including financing, including on industrial policy, including on debt management. I think in ways that we need, you know, China has its own agenda, of course, like any large uh, uh, economy, but I think there is more space for a, construct, a constructive discussion with China than, than there has been with some of the Western powers in the last uh, 20, 30 years. It doesn't mean that it's smooth or easy, but it is a dis and I think that discussion is beginning to force changes amongst uh, advanced economies, and we just have to keep pushing away at it. I, 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 you know, I, I mean, the worry is, can we do it in time? We've got a few more minutes here, so we should close it up because I know there's, you've got a, a plane to catch to get back to London. 
Um, I guess the question is, do we go back to Bretton Woods or forward to Jakarta? Or uh, because if you look at, at look at many of the things on your list here, many Asian countries, not just China, are doing a lot of this stuff already, right? They've got a whole bunch of savings that they've mobilized. They've got massive national development banks that were never closed down like the ones in your region of the world. Um, and they, they have very strict regulations on finance to make sure that the financial system finances projects and people rather than just turns money over in a repo, repo market or not like it's happening here in the past couple of weeks. Um, and so we'll have to, have to and, and they put so much money into innovation. They average about 30 to 40 percent, you know, up to 40, 30 to 40 percent of annual investments in innovation. And so that one slide that you have there that has the financialization going up, but the average amount of developing country investment is uh, has been stagnant or going down. Um, that's amazing that the whole total is stagnant or going down given the fact that in that same graph you have Asia going like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is pretty fascinating. Well, this is a, an ongoing conversation that we have here at the GHP Center on many facets. We're really happy that all of you came here to join us. Uh, please sign up on our, um, uh, on our iPad out there to find out more about different events that we're having across the semester. And thank you everybody for coming. Please uh, thank our guest from UNCAD, Richard Cobb. Kevin. And uh, congratulations on your work. It's really a breath of fresh air that you don't hear on